Hey, welcome back to the One Year Bible Journey. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel, and we are starting week 17. And I am so excited that you've made it this far and you're sticking with it. No matter what your pace, don't give up. Don't use this as a stick to beat yourself with. If you fall off the wagon, just get back up, get back on, and and you'll catch up soon enough. So we're in week 17. Your reading this week is 1 Samuel 11 to 25. John 8 to 12, Psalm 51 to 53. Once again, that's 1 Samuel 11 to 25, John 8 to 12, Psalm 51 to 53. I have some great things in store for you today. At the end, we're going to look at some maps. We're going to look at some photos of some of these locations. But first, I want to tell you the story. And remember where we are in the story. The highest view of this is that we've moved into the period of the kings. We've transitioned from the family of Abraham to the children of Israel enslaved in Egypt, to the wandering in the wilderness and God organizing his people and leading them in spite of their disobedience, and then through Joshua leading them into the promised land, conquering, occupying, dividing up the promised land to the 12 tribes, and then into the period of the judges where the people got far from God. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was total national disunity. There was much idolatry. There was much oppression from the enemies. And Satan did everything he could do to try to disrupt the plan of God and the people of God from fulfilling the will of God. But God preserved. God worked anyway. God worked through carnal judges. God worked through evil situations. And he protected and preserved his people And then he brought a man onto the scene named Samuel, and we read his story last week in chapters 1 through 7 of 1 Samuel. Samuel was a man that, from a boy, grew up in a corrupt system, but loved God, followed God, heard from God. And God used Samuel as a prophet and a priest to sort of be the national spiritual leader. He wasn't a king. He was like the national pastor. He held the nation together. He traveled from north to south, and he kind of reunited the tribes, reminded them of their heritage and who God was, and sort of brought unity back to them. The people were unhappy with Samuel and unhappy that they didn't have a king like other nations. God wanted to be their king, but they wouldn't have that. They insisted on a human king. And so we began to read in chapters 8 and forward about God relenting, God giving the people a king even though he wanted to be their king, and warning them that it wasn't going to go well, and surely it isn't going to go well. So the highest view of this is that this story is all about and points to and leads to Jesus. How's it all about Jesus when he's not even on the scene yet? Well, he's working behind the scenes. He's orchestrating the plan of redemption. And so there's two ways that this story points to represents, leads to, pictures, and culminates in Jesus. The first sense is very literally that there are links in this genealogical chain that lead to a Savior. God has promised from the seed of Abraham to multiply his seed and to provide through that lineage, through that heritage, a Savior, and that will be Jesus. Satan knows that. Satan is going to persecute and fight against and war against these people all the way up to Jesus. He's going to try to prevent Jesus from ever being born. You're going to see that again today. All of the enemies, all the oppression, all the battling, all the fighting, all has to do with disrupting God's plan. There's a Satan behind all of it. So in a very specific way, the redemptive plan is going forward through this lineage, through this heritage, and God miraculously leads these people forward, not because they are good, but because he is good and he is faithful to his covenant. He's a redeemer. He's a savior. The second way that we see this story pointing to Jesus is that he is the greater fulfillment of all of the attempts of humanity to fill the needs of our heart, to save our souls, to save ourselves, to save our people and our tribes and nations. So let's think about this. Um, Jesus is the greater Moses. He's the greater leader. He's the perfect leader. Jesus is the greater sacrifice, the greater lamb. He's going to be the final and ultimate lamb of God. Jesus is the greater priest in the midst of all the broken and insufficient priests. Jesus will one day come to be the ultimate fulfillment of the priesthood, and he will make us priests. He'll give us access to God because he will be the great high priest. Jesus is the greater judge. All of the judges failed. All the judges were imperfect. They were insufficient. But Jesus is going to come one day and be the ultimate and the final 
and the comprehensive judge. And he's going to bring perfect, perfect, righteous judgment. So the judges failed. Jesus is the perfect judge. The priests failed. Jesus is the perfect and ultimate high priest. The sacrifices were insufficient. Jesus will be the final and ultimate sufficient sacrifice. And now we're going to see the kings. The kings will fail. Every king will prove to be insufficient, but Jesus, it just points to the great. The, the cry of our hearts is for a greater king, a perfect king, an ultimate king. And every four years in America, we reelect another king, and we hope that this is going to be the savior of the world, and it never happens. So this story is still continuing on. Our hearts long for a great king, the king of kings, who will also be a great priest and a great savior and a great sacrifice and a great judge. All of these roles that man fails, all the plans of man fail. Man cannot save himself. All the broken saviors point to the ultimate need for a perfect, eternal, heavenly savior, and that's Jesus. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise in every way. And he is the full, he's, he is who the stories are all leading to. It all builds up to the arrival of Jesus. So today our reading picks up in chapter 11 of 1 Samuel. There's two parts to 1 Samuel. Chapters 1 to 7 was Samuel's story we read last week. And chapters 8 to 31 is Saul's story, and essentially the rise and fall of the first king of Israel. Saul is full of promise. He begins as a young, unexpecting man that God selects, <clears throat> but he's full of character flaws. He's totally insufficient, and ultimately his pride literally drives him to a kind of insanity. And because of that, God rejects Saul and chooses David. So the kingly line is going to shift to David. God, we see in this, God blesses humility, and he opposes pride. And then Saul, throughout the rest of the book of 1 Samuel, it's Saul's decline. He descends into insanity and self-destruction. He runs after David, tries to pursue and kill him. David is very strategic in how he responds. We're going to talk about that a little more. And David's true character rises to the surface as well as Saul's true character rising to the surface. It's interesting to note too that as you're reading the Psalms, many of the Psalms are written during this period in the life of David. Some were written earlier in David's youth as he was a shepherd. Now many of them are written when he's fleeing from and hiding from Saul because he has been anointed as the next king, but he's going through this dark, terrible time where he's displaced, homeless, running for his life, fleeing for his life, and he's waiting for God to bring this all together, and he refuses to take matters into his own hands. So David goes to God and he writes a lot of Psalms during this period. And I just want to say the Psalms overlay the narrative. So right now we're reading historical narrative. We're reading Old Testament history, which is fun reading. Uh, the, the genre of scripture is going to change. We've already read the law. We've come through that. You survived that. Praise God. Now we're reading history as we come into the Kings, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, all these books are going to describe for us the, the, the historical narrative of the kings of Israel, their failures, their insufficiencies, their successes, their paganism, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it pointing to the need for a one-day ultimate king of kings. So we're in this period of historical narrative, and the reading is going to be, for the most part, intriguing and interesting and engaging. But when you get into poetry, when you get into prophets, uh, these prophets and poetry overlay this period of Israel's history. And so we'll unfold that when we get to that part of the Old Testament in our future reading. You just got to remember that the Bible has different genres. It's not always a linear storyline, okay? So as you're reading Psalms, just realize you've read some Psalms that David writes during these struggles we're going to read about this week. And so the Psalms give us the inside out view, like what was the character feeling, praying? How was this character walking with God when he's running and fleeing to the cave of Adullam and to the cave of En Gedi and all these different places in, in the land of Israel? You're going to see and read a lot of geography in this week's reading. And so that's why I'm going to pull up the map in just a se second to give you your bearings and give you your orientation. And then I'm going to share with you some 
with you some photos of some of these sites that I visited that pertain to your reading this week. So what are you going to read this week? You're going to pick it up in chapter 11. Saul has now been anointed king, and he's going to go to battle against the Philistines. And you're going to read some battles where he fights the Philistines, he fights the Amalekites, and he wins some victories, and God blesses and raises him up in leadership. Chapter 12 is kind of sad. It's Samuel's farewell address. It's almost like now that you have a king, you don't need me. Now, Samuel's going to stick around for a while. He's still going to be a very important, significant spiritual leader. But this is sort of his farewell time. And one thing I want you to catch here is he recounts, he tells the story of the nation's history, which is kind of cool how God has built into the narrative kind of a review like we just did to catch you up, to remind you all that God has done up to this point and how faithful he has been. So Samuel ends this chapter by telling them to serve the Lord with all their hearts, to remember the great things he has done for them and uh, to, 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 that he is going to continue teaching them. He's not going to so much rule over them as he's going to continue teaching them uh, how to do what is right. Such a great challenge in chapter 12. Chapter 13, you're going to begin reading of Saul's pride, his disobedience regarding offerings, and then Samuel's rebuke. So Saul is going to start declining. Chapter 14, Jonathan's going to have a courageous victory, and Saul is going to do something extremely foolish and come very close to killing his own son. Again, the foolishness and the pride and the arrogance and the and the depravity of Saul just gets worse and worse. Chapter 15, Saul against the Amalekites. Uh, these were descendants of Esau. And uh, the Lord, as a result of a failed, uh, a failed leadership, uh, he rejects Saul. And Saul feigns repentance in this moment, but Saul makes a bad decision here and doesn't obey God fully. Chapter 16, because the Lord has rejected Saul, Samuel's sad. Samuel is grieving this. There's a lot of emotion here. There's a lot of politics here, national politics, as the nation is developing in this new era. There's a lot of political treachery and and uh, backstabbing and spying and it it's it almost is going to read in 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 the reign of Saul and David it's going to read like a thriller okay so if you like thrillers you're going to read of all kinds of characters and uh, and all kinds of political alliances and and uh, and David and Saul navigating this time Saul in foolishness David in wisdom so chapter 16 is amazing because God chooses this shepherd boy David to be the next king. It's the last thing David ever expects. It's the last thing his family expects. Samuel anoints David to be the king long before he's prominent, before he ever kills Goliath, before he ever rises up in prominence. It's it's an amazing moment out of the blue where God chooses this faithful shepherd boy and now begins to shape him into a king. Chapter 17, David is the pizza delivery guy, delivers bread and cheese to his brothers who are fighting or in a standoff, really, with uh, the with the Philistines at the Valley of Elah. This is just south uh, west of the city of Jerusalem. Now, at the time of this reading, there is no city of Jerusalem. It's called Jebus. It's a Jebusite city. It it it, it existed in Judges as Jerusalem, but the Jebusites were not driven out, and the Israelites didn't fully occupy. And so now the Jebusites have basically taken over, and uh, it's it's a city of Jebus, and it's going to be recovered eventually. This is the city that goes all the way back to Genesis, where Abraham met Melchizedek, the city of Salem. It's interesting how it's it was at one point God's city, and then it was overrun by Canaanites, and then it was co- co-occupied with Israelites, and then it was Canaanites again, and one day it's going to be Jerusalem again in our reading. You'll see that coming soon enough. So, um, so anyway, David goes out to the battle, and Goliath is threatening, and you read the historic, the great battle of David going to fight Goliath. And I love what David says. He says, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David understands who God is. David gets it. David understands the gospel through Old Testament terms. David has placed his faith and trust in the God of Israel and realizes that this man is is challenging God. David also realizes he has what's called a theocratic anointing. First time I heard those words, I was like, what is that? It simply means David has been chosen by God. David's been promised by God that he's going to be the next king. 
So he has a sense of faith and invulnerability. He knows what God has promised him. You say, why did he have the courage to go fight Goliath? Well, not only because he had slain the lion and the bear, and he's really good with a sling. He had the courage to fight Goliath because he knew that God had chosen him to be the next king, and God had promised that he would be the next king. So he knew he wasn't going to lose. He knew he wasn't going to die. Um, he knows the future in a sense. So in that sense, God's told us as children of, 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 of Jesus, as 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 uh, Christians, he's told us we are already winners. We're already victors. We are conquerors. We're more than conquerors. And so we are to go out and fight our battles in similar fashion. But listen, the story of David and Goliath is not so much about you fighting your giants. That's how it's typically preached. It's really about someone else fighting the giants for you. So imagine this, all the soldiers are on the ridge near Azekah, and they're looking down on Goliath, and they're all afraid to fight him. He is too big to conquer. And so David goes out as a representative of his people, and he fights the battle and wins, and he wins victory for everybody. And you know, that's the, the point of the story, or the reason the story is in the narrative, is that the greater David, Jesus, will go against the greater giant, Satan, who we are all powerless to win against. And he went into battle and conquered and crushed the head of the serpent and came out of battle and he secured one representative head, secured victory for all of us. You see, the victory of one became the victory of all. It's an imputed victory and that's what salvation is. So David and Goliath is not a picture of how to defeat your giants on your own and how to have courage in battle. No, the The story of David and Goliath is a picture of how Jesus went and fought the giants for us. So don't forget that. That's that's very, very important, that we take a redemptive view of all of these stories and that uh, it's not about us getting better. It's about God fighting the battles for us. And it's been that way all the way through the narrative, hasn't it? Chapter 18, David and Jonathan, Saul's son, become fast friends. Jonathan is one of my heroes in Scripture because he recognized, you know, John is, Jonathan is the right, I'm going to call him John, Jonathan is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel by blood, but he recognizes that God has chosen David, that God has anointed David, and he accepts that. He surrenders to that, but Saul begins to despise and scorn and be jealous. His pride and jealousy rises up, and he resents David because God is elevating David. So this gets to be really politically complex and relationally complex. Chapter 19, Saul tries to kill David, but uh, David is saved by Saul's daughter, who is also David's wife, Michael. And uh, the the story gets even more complicated. Chapter 20, Jonathan helps David to escape, and they lovingly, weepingly part ways. It's sad. This story goes up and down. It reads almost like a novel. Chapter 21, Saul chases David once he realizes that he has fled. David flees to the land of Nob and then to Gath, which is the headquarters of the Philistines where he fakes insanity. And then he flees to a cave. Chapter 22, he is at the cave of Adullam, which is not far actually from the Valley of Elah. David would have been familiar with all this area because this is where he kept his sheep. This is the area south, uh, southwest of Bethlehem. Now, want, let me let me give you your bearings for a minute. We're going to see the map in a second. David has kept sheep in Bethlehem. During certain seasons, the the grass grows brown in Bethlehem, so David would go southwest toward the Mediterranean coast, which is greener, longer, and during more seasons, it's green and lush. And so, where would he have gone? He would have gone down into this area of the Valley of Elah, down into this area where there's a cave of Adullam. He's very familiar with this area, so he flees there. This is not only where he kept sheep, it's also where he killed Goliath. It's where he has spent time in his boyhood, so he's very familiar with this. So that's the cave of Adullam, and 400 men gather towards David, and they congregate around David as a leader. Uh, They're displaced. They're kind of the unwanted riffraff of society, but they become David's mighty men. David at one point goes out to Moab, which is to the east, um, and Saul is chasing him and slaughters. It's a terrible story here in chapter 22 where Saul slaughters the priests that helped David, except for one. One son escapes to go tell David, 
And that son becomes very critical. Abiathar becomes very critical in the, in the future story of David. Chapter 23, David fights for the town of Keilah, saves them from the Philistines, and then continues to flee south to the wilderness of Ziph. The wilderness of Ziph is, is going to become a desert country, hill country, uh, getting towards the Negev Desert. It's, it's uh, sort of between Beersheba and... Um, and Masada. It's, and I'll show you pictures in just a minute. Jonathan comes to him and affirms God's covenant again in this chapter. It's a powerful portion. And then David flees to the wilderness of Maon and to the cave of En Gedi, which is down by the shores of the Dead Sea. And I'll show you pictures of that as well in just a moment. Chapter 24, Saul takes 3,000 men when he finds out where David is, David has 400 men, Saul has 3,000 men, and David is hiding in this cave of En Gedi. And you can only imagine, uh, and for many years until I went there, how do 400 men fit into this cave? 400 men hiding in a cave, Saul goes into this cave to essentially use the restroom, to uh, relieve himself. 400 men hiding in this cave, David they're like, David, this is your chance. Go kill him. David sneaks over and somehow cuts off a corner of Saul's clothing. Maybe he set it down to go relieve himself. I, don't, I can only imagine how we could get that close that quietly. And I'll tell you how in just a minute when I show you the pictures. It's going to make perfect sense to you. Saul... Um, leaves the cave not knowing that the 400 men were there in hiding and not knowing that David had snuck up and cut off a corner of his clothing. David immediately regrets doing this and feels terrible. But David goes out and reveals himself to Saul and shows how he could have killed Saul and has this great interaction with Saul where Saul feigns repentance. Saul gets emotional. Saul's uh, almost bipolar. He ping-pongs back and forth irrationally. And... Um, and so Saul at this point feigns repentance and refuses to uh, kill David in this moment. I want you to note this, and this is really why this story is in Scripture. David has been promised by God that he's going to the throne and is going to later be promised by God that he's going to be, that his throne is going to be the lineage of the throne of Jesus, the Messiah. David doesn't want to seize the throne. He doesn't want to take matters into his own hands. He doesn't want to do the right thing, become king, the wrong way. And this is such a practical lesson for us. David had so many opportunities to seize the throne, to get a following, to do a hostile takeover, to basically commit treason. But he says, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. God had anointed Saul, and God had anointed David. And so David was brilliant and very wise by saying, God, you deal with Saul. You make me king your way in your time. This was brilliant. Why? Because this way there was no civil war. There was no national division. It's very tenuous. David becoming king, you'll see, it's very complex and very politically nuanced, which is why it was brilliant for David to trust God. How often are we tempted to take matters into our own hands when we should wait it out, put it in God's hands, and let him orchestrate the details and follow him through the complexities? Maybe you're dealing with something that's politically or relationally or spiritually complex, maybe in your family, maybe in your church, maybe in some other way, maybe at your workplace. Listen, put it in God's hands, trust God, follow him, he can bring you through. He might bring you through some suffering, some rejection. He might require you to go through some hard, dark times. Then go to the Psalms and see how David handled these times of wandering and fleeing and fearing for his life. Uh, and you'll see God brought him through all of this intentionally. God's shaping him and making him. And God's ver uh, verifying. He's validating his character. He is proving David's spiritual maturity and depth through all of this time, so that when he does become king, he's going to have proven himself to all these people. Pay very close attention to the last chapter you're going to read today because Abigail says it best. Abigail says, I know your character. I know your heart. See, David is a billboard of innocence, while Saul is a billboard of treachery. 
and dishonesty and irrational foolishness. So as Saul descends into destruction and David ascends to the throne, everybody sees it's God leading this. And so that's why David ends up taking the throne with credibility in God's time and leading the nation into a very wonderful time of flourishing that's yet ahead in our reading. So let me see here. Chapter 24, chapter 25, Samuel dies. What a sad moment. He's been a good character to follow along. He's been a good man who served God faithfully. Wasn't a great dad, but he was still a man of God and he was a good spiritual leader. We're going to read a story in chapter 25 of a man named Nabal and his wife, Abigail. And it's quite a story in another opportunity where David almost takes matters into his own hands, but doesn't. And he ends up getting a wife out of this uh, story. Abigail becomes uh, David's wife. I want to comment on one thing, because as you close chapter 25, the story times out. We're going to pick it up here next week. And you're going to read that David at this point has three wives. He has Michael, who was Saul's daughter, who when, when David flees, Saul gives that wife, that daughter to another man to wife. But uh, the story comes back around to Michael. You'll see that. Um, David now takes Abigail as his wife and also a lady named Ahinoam from Jezreel, which is a city in the northern part of the country. Ahinoam, Abigail, and Michael. Is God for polygamy? No. David should never have married three wives. And later he's going to get a fourth, Bathsheba, and the way he gets her is tragic and terrible. So David is, even though David's a good king, even though David's a man after God's own heart, David already, we see, is a flawed human being. He's already making some grave mistakes that are going to uh, grow a, a really tough and a, and a brutal harvest. David's going to have kids by these wives, and they're not going to get along so well, and things are going to go badly. So David's unwise decisions are going to grow an unwise harvest, a harvest that he doesn't want. So um, we're going to pause it here for today in the narrative, and we're going to pick up this story next week. So let's look at, before I let you go, let's look at some maps, okay? First, I'm going to go to the map, and then we're going to go to some photos. So this is the land of Israel, and these are the Old Testament sites. I'm going to zoom in here and uh, show you a little bit of this territory. So David becomes king. Um, let me, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to show you the kingdom, I'm just, first let's do the tribal borders, okay? So this is what the nation of Israel looks like during the period of the judges, J Joshua, judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. You have all the tribal distinctions. You have uh, Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh on the uh, east side of the Jordan River. And then you have all these tribes on the west side of the Jordan River. Judah sort of surrounds Simeon. Dan is the smallest portion of land and you remember the story of Dan they don't like their land which is crazy because that's a great spot of land uh, and they go all the way up here to Laish and they take over some land up here in the northern part of Naphtali and Manasseh and they occupy here which doesn't go well so this is the breakdown of the land I want to talk to you about the city of Shiloh it's right here in the northern well it looks on this map it looks like the central part of the country but it's north of jerusalem jerusalem is uh going to be down here where the word benjamin is and you if you try and this is the spine of the country this the, this is the hill country so if you go up to shiloh everything we read about in uh, the book of judges and early samuel so samuel grew up in shiloh the priest Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Hannah's prayer happened in Shiloh. And so this is a an amazing site to visit. It's still an incredible site to visit today uh, in the Old Testament. This was the capital of the nation all through the period of Joshua, Judges, and early 1 Samuel until David conquers Jerusalem. And, uh, and so let me, let me quickly go and show you some pictures of Shiloh. Uh, let me pull up that screen for you. Okay, so this is modern-day Shiloh. 
And this is a touristy section of where they believe the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. I'm just going to scroll through this. You can see the, the barrenness of the hills. Uh, this is a glimpse north from Bethel towards Shiloh. So you can kind of see the hill country that I'm talking about. This is also Bethel now looking uh, towards the Jordan Valley. So we're looking east. Uh, this is where Abraham and Lot parted ways. But in the, in the time of Samuel, this would have been some of the country that he traversed visiting the tribes and the people. Bethel was all, always kind of a sacred site. This is a tomb, an old cave there at Bethel. So now we're back in Shiloh to the north, just north of Bethel, maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, I'm looking west here. I'm standing at the site of Bethel, looking west, and just want you to get a feel for the, for the topography, the land itself. Uh, the trees were in bloom. This was a spring visit to Bethel, so the almond trees were starting to bloom. Now I'm standing looking at the hills east uh, from the site of Bethel. So north to the left of where I'm standing is the actual excavation of the city. And uh, this is looking east to the hills surrounding Bethel. So, I'm sorry, a, uh, Shiloh. Did I say Bethel? This is Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh, the hills surrounding Shiloh would have been where the people camped together when they came together for their feasts and their sacrifices. Now, this is the ruins at Shiloh. So the city of Shiloh, where Samuel grew up and where he home-based and where the tabernacle was set up and where the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines, which we've already read. Um, so these are the ruins and the excavations. And now we're looking. So in this one, we're looking north. In this one, we're looking west. And you can see the homes built into the rock and then the farmland out beyond the city. And now we're at the peak of the ruins, the tell, the word is tell, the excavations. Uh, the word in Hebrew means city, tell. And we're looking down towards the location where the tabernacle would have been set up. And across the valley, you see the hillsides where uh, archaeologists and historians have found remnants of campsites and arrowheads and remnants of, of animals and, for, you know, ancient sites where, the, again, the people of Israel came and encamped around this city for all of their celebrations, their feasts, their festivals, Passover, Feast of uh, Trumpets, Festival of Tents. We could go on and on. So now I'm still at the, at the peak of the tell, uh, looking now sort of northwest um, and you can just see again the hill country. This is all, by the way, modern day West Bank. This is modern day Palestinian occupied territory. And this was just on the drive, taking some pictures. I just wanted you to see the terraced hillsides. Uh, and you can see how these terraces have existed for thousands of years. And it's a rugged land, rocky land. Um, and it would have been a, a hard place to live. Uh, very minimal water, total dependent on rainfall. This is why droughts were such a critical thing. And, uh, and God providing water and rain so that the crops could, uh, could grow. You can imagine shepherds grazing their sheep in these hills and uh, taking them to lower land when these hills go brown. This is another shot of Bethel. So Bethel and Shiloh are sites that are not far from each other. This is a shot from Bethel, I believe, looking kind of northeast towards Shiloh. Shiloh would be over past the farthest ridge in that picture. Okay, so I want to go back now to the map. And I want to pull up on the map the kingdom of Saul. So let me just zoom out here and show you. This is the kingdom that Saul reigned over. And then when David comes to power, we haven't gotten there yet, but this is going to be the lay of the land when he becomes king and his enemies that surround him, Philistines. You can see how Philistia is modern day Gaza. Um, you can see the nation of Israel and then the land of Moab, Ammon, and Aram. So we're going to go out of this. And I want to show you David's, let me see here, uh, no sites. I'm trying to set this up here. Sorry about this. I'll tell, let me just go back to this. Okay. 
And now we're going to show David's uh, journeys. Let me just kind of pull this up because you're going to be reading about a lot of this wandering of David. Let's go first to David and Goliath, okay? So let me zoom out and show you where this is in relation to Jerusalem. So as I said, you've got Jerusalem, and David would have kept his sheep from Bethlehem and going south and west. Well, what is south and west but the cave of Adullam and the valley of Elah, which is right here where my red arrow is. And so you can see the blue line is where the Israelites were encamped near Azekah. The red line across the valley is where the Philistines were encamped. So I'm going to zoom back into this and uh, and show you this valley kind of dog legs around. David and Goliath would have met in this valley here. And what's interesting about this location and the battle you're going to read is if the Israelites were here and the Philistines were here, it means they were in a standoff and they had outflanked each other. Now watch this. The home for the Israelites, which are camped here, is Jerusalem and Bethlehem. The home for the Philistines, which are camped here, is Gath. And so they're in a standoff right here, and neither one of them wants to move. And the kind of the idea, the unspoken idea is if the Philistines go this way, you know, the Philistines could say, well, we've got you. We've got your people. But the Israelites could say, well, if you go to our people, we're going to go get your people. And so they're in a standoff here. Nobody wants to move. And so their solution is to send out this giant into this valley. And David arrives, and, uh, and as we know the story, he defeats Goliath. And then the Philistines flee and the Israelites chase after them and win the victory. So it's very interesting to see the geography and the topography of that area and, and how that plays out. Now, after this victory, let me pull up David's journeys of flight or David's wanderings. And you can just kind of watch this animation and then I'll kind of break it down for you. As, and you can kind of match it up with your reading. It's, it's pretty significant when you look at this land that David, um, that David fled to and that David wandered and, and hid in. So Saul is reigning up here in Gibeah, which is north of what will one day be Jerusalem and Ramah. And then uh, he, David ends up running over here to Gath and then to the cave, a cave in Adullam, which isn't far from the Valley of Elah, which is right there. And then he goes over here into the area of Moab. You're going to read about that. And then he circles back up and around to Keilah, this town that is being oppressed by the Philistines. And he fights, and the Philistines run, and he delivers them. And then David flees over to the wilderness of Maun, which I'll show you the pictures of that in just a moment. And then he ends up over here in En Gedi, which is where he cuts off the corner of Saul's robe. He then circles back around to Carmel. This is not Mount Carmel, by the way. And then he goes up here back to Gath and then out here to Ziklag, which is not yet in our reading. It's coming. Okay, I want to go now to, I want to go to um, pictures and I want to show you the wilderness of En Gedi. So let me go back to the top here. And here is the Negev Desert. These particular photos were taken from Masada, but it all looks pretty much the same. Very rugged country where David fled and south of Jerusalem. As you're there, you can't help but see these trees with long, strong, stiff thorns, and they're incredibly painful. So I took a couple pictures of those. These are the caves. These are some of the caves that are in the cliffs as you're approaching the main cave of En Gedi. This is what the country, the rock country, the desert country looks like. This is the first thing you see when you come to En Gedi as you walk back up the ravine. There is a lower waterfall. There's a spring at En Gedi. This is why David fled there because there's a good water supply. It's a very narrow gorge coming out of the hills. It's uh, nearly impossible to get to except through the, the narrow gorge, and so it's easily defensible. He and his 400 men made this trek up this ravine, 
if you turn around from that spot where I just took the, 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 the look of the spring here, turn around the hike up, that's the view looking back behind you. You're, you're scaling up into this, these hills and you're seeing the lower area of the Dead Sea and the mountains of Moab across the Dead Sea to the east. And as you turn a little to the north, and I think this one was actually taken from Masada again. Masada is right near En Gedi. Uh, they're maybe 20 minutes apart, both of them at the lower end of the Dead Sea. And looking, uh, looking north up the ridge of the desert that descends down to the Dead Sea, this is the view. Again, these are all shots from Masada, looking over to Moab uh, and to the southern part of the Dead Sea, the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is looking north along the Dead Sea. And I just want to put my arrow here. This is a, the area of Engedi is right up in here. So this shot was taken from uh, Masada looking north towards Engedi. We're going to get back to Engedi in just a moment. But again, just more shots of the of the rough, rugged nature of these of this land. These shots were actually taken at the Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And uh, this is actually the northern part of Jericho along the same ridge of mountains heading up towards Jerusalem. So I'm going to try to get down back down to the cave. Let me see here. Uh, excuse me for going fast through these photos. Okay, here we go. Now we're, we're, we're looking at the water for the upper waterfall of the spring that's in at En Gedi. The word En, E-I-N, means, means spring. And Gedi means goat. So this is the spring of the goat. That's why it's called En Gedi. You'll see why in just a moment. Interesting thing about this waterfall is it's loud. It produces loud white noise constantly, 24-7. And the other interesting thing you need to know about this story is that this waterfall was inside the cave where you see sky right here. It's, it's collapsed. This used to be the roof of the cave, and it was a massive cavern. It was a massive enclosure that in the back of this enclosure was this tall, very tall waterfall spring. Now, you can get a picture, a kind of a sense of the size of this with this shot, because this is our tour group that has scaled up to this cave and are now climbed down inside of the mouth of this cave. You can see the roof of this cave remaining what remains of it you can see the i don't know if they're stalactites or mites that grow down from the cave but they don't grow in open spaces they grow in enclosed spaces and so these rocks on the ground used to be the roof of this cave that extended out over this massive opening and you can see the height of this waterfall and i'm telling you again it's loud so you're to be heard you have to shout when you're standing there because the waterfall is loud. Here's another shot of what is now collapsed. Oops, I'm sorry. You can see the roof of the cave. And, um, and so you can see how David would have been able to hide with 400 men in this cave. And you can also see why they would have not been detected. It's at night. The water is loud. These men could have been sneezing, coughing, whispering, talking. They wouldn't have been heard because the waterfall would have masked the noise. And so that gives you a bit of a understanding of the topography and what's going on in the stories that you're going to read. And it gives you a little bit of the geography, the location, the map locations of these places. And I hope that this helps you understand your reading this week. So we're going to put a pin in it right there. Wow, I went way too long today. But thank you for spending time with me in uh, Old Testament reading in 1 Samuel. And today is week 17. So I love to read your comments, share with me what God's teaching you. I'll see you tomorrow in the New Testament and we'll press on. Have a great day.